All right, we're, <coughs> excuse me. we're still on the series called uh, Real Christianity. And this morning we're still, this is lesson number two. But I took lesson number two and I, I knew when I saw it, it's going to have to be more than just one lesson on number two. It's going to be a two-part at least. So this is part A of lesson number two. And this is about the real Jesus this morning. And there we are. And I know I have to keep looking to make sure I'm clicking right and it's all moving, so in the right direction. This next, uh, the title here, Unexpected Savior. When I saw that in the lesson, eh, I don't quite like the word unexpected. I mean, to the world in a sense, it might have been, he might, the Lord Jesus Christ might have been unexpected to them, but he was not unexpected. And my first thought was, and I'll show you the passage here, is Galatians 4 and chapter 4, chapter 4, verses 4 and verse 5, about that. But so, I, as I went through this lesson, I kind of, kind of like a disclaimer, I guess you want to say. I didn't lay out this lesson and start it out, but I would not have used unexpected Savior. But I understand, I think, what the author was trying to say. To the world, the Savior might have been unexpected to them in a way. But was the Lord Jesus Christ unexpected to come into the world? No, he wasn't. Because we know that the prophecies were there and they knew about the prophecies. Some of those people knew about the prophecies that the Messiah was going to come. The Savior was going to come. So we're going to talk about a little about that this morning as well. Most, and about the prophecies and some of those things. I don't want to be lost into the the information that I'm going to share with you, but I need, we need to kind of like lay out the groundwork about this, about when our Lord came and understand that, about the time when He came. But when the fullness of time was come, that's from Galatians. But we'll talk about that. So that's where I'm starting out with this. So this lesson is going to be on two parts, at least. I think two parts will be sufficient enough. But like I said, when I first saw it, I said, there's no way I can cram this in, and I don't want to cram it and then walk out the door and say, check off the box. We got done with the lesson. I'd rather cover it more thoroughly if we can, please. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen, by, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up to the glory. Now Paul wrote this, and there it is. Paul wrote this, in the book of Timothy, had he been in the ministry for several years, and he's pointing out this, the same thing that's always been known, you know, he knew and he was preaching all the time, is what? Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, and that is God coming in the flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ coming to come for us. To do what? To save us from our sins. So here's the passage, I, Galatians chapter 4, and verse 4 and 5. Like I said, when I when I first saw this lesson, this was not initially in this lesson series, but when I saw the title, I said, now, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5 is very needed to see this, to see in relationship to all of this. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. What do you see there? What do you see in that passage? It's all about the fulfillment of God's all, all, true. All about God's fulfillment of time. This point in time. That's what we're going to deal with here. This, mainly this lesson is going to talk about the, but the fullness of time. About this, about the Lord Jesus Christ coming. When you see my timeline, you know, you're, y'all could probably sketch this timeline. I know y'all can. I need to give you all just a, a sheet of paper and say, sketch it out for me. You've seen it so many times. But this is the timeline over there to where you see where Job is over to your left. Um, and you got Abraham and Moses and all that. That's be, you know, before, right before that is the beginning of the creation. So it kind of gives you the timeline of the Old Testament there as it flows through. But through that, it comes to what point? It comes to the cross. It comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this is... It's moving and has moved to this point where it says, but when the fullness of time was come. All of these events took place. All these prophecies that were given to do what? To talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and about Him and about Him coming into the world in there. So if you see in the timeline, you're very familiar with I know you got to be by this time. And uh, 
But to see it, and I like using it because I see that in a chronological way for me, but, but when the fullness of time comes, that's when about the Lord Jesus Christ coming into that world. So when Jesus came into the world, what was the world like at that time? And why at that time? Why not earlier? Why not now? Why wouldn't he have come now and waited all those extra, you know, waited some more years and came now? But that's not God's plan, was it? God had a plan laid out. And his plan was at this point in time when he came, there's a reason why he came that time. So what was the world like at that time? What was the setting for him to come into the world when the Lord Jesus Christ came? Jesus was a person. He's the son of God. He wasn't a, 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 like some other religious person, religious I. Uh, make believe. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God who came and stepped out and, and, and touched and came to the earth, was born of a virgin. Was he not? He came here to be with us at that point in time. In that, time, in that period of time, Israel was like this. That's about what Israel looked like and who it was ruled by. Uh, as you would see here, uh, Herod the Great, is it pulling up there? Yeah. Herod the Great, and he had those areas there, of course. And then you had, uh, he had Judah and Samaria. And then you had Herod Antipasus. He had Galilee and Perea. And then you had, get rid of that. Then you had uh, Philip down here at the bottom. He had these other two areas here. So that's the world he came into, was divided up among these. And who was Herod? What was this, who's this guy Herod, who was Herod the Great and his, his family? What were those people? Were they a nice bunch of people? No way. Far from it. They were far from it. None of these guys were nice at all. Were they in our lives? But this is the world he came into. In that time, this is the religious groups that were there. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, the Sanhedrins. Now, as you look at each one of these groups, these are the religious groups. Pharisees, they were a sect of the Jews. They were strict observance of Moses' rituals. Outwardly morally, moral, but Jesus condemned them. Reference to their righteousness, their own self-righteousness. <clears throat> You've always probably heard, heard the phrase about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What's the difference? What's the key difference between the two? Resurrection. The resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. Didn't believe in that. And the Sadducees were a sect of the Jews as well, but they denied the resurrection. They rebuked and were silenced by the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Do you, I don't know if you remember months ago when Pastor Coffey was teaching on us on Wednesday nights. He was going through uh, the Gospels there and talking. I think it was Mark, I would want to say, but I'm not sure. But he was talking about the, the scribes and the Pharisees and their relationship and how they tried to, uh, they were constantly attacking the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him questions, just constantly after him all the time. <clears throat> excuse me. The scribes <clears throat> were lawyers. <clears throat> excuse me. Were lawyers of law. They were learned in the law. They, have, they, they were offended by Christ's teaching. You're going to see some of those passages here in a moment. We get into here a little bit further in. And also the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin probably started up during the, I don't know if you remember on the timeline, that 400 silent years, right before that, when Israel and was in captivity of the Assyrians and and the Babylonians, during that time period is probably when the Sanhedrin was developed there and the synagogues were developed among them. And this was a ruling group, especially when they got to this point in time. They were the ruling group, the ruling religious group in Israel. I'm not trying to bore you with history or any of that kind of information, but I want you to get the setting here a little bit to understand this time. Here we get to the political group, the political settings, the Herod. Herod's family. <clears throat> they were a political group. Herod was the great. Uh, uh, Herod the Great was appointed by Rome as king of the Jews, and he he was related to Edomites. The Edomites were what? Did it go? Oh, didn't move on there. I'm sorry. I thought I did it click. Who were the Edomites in relationship to Israel? Were they good friends? They got along really great. You know, good. You know, no, they didn't. There was always, always over the years, there was always that conflict between them. And here you got a guy who's an Edomite, who's in control of the Jews, claims to be the king of the Jews himself, also over the Jews and ruling them at this time. Herodians, they were the political group that followed, uh, they were not 
Herod's family, but they were the group that kind of followed him around and were very much for and supported and promoted the Herods. <clears throat> of course, the Romans were in control of everything. They ruled the world. They were the empire at this time. Who were the other empires that come along before them? The world had been controlled by other empires, big major empires. Weren't they not controlled by the Greeks just previously before the Romans came along? And the Romans came along, they were a little bit differently. They ruled the world at this time, and in 63 BC, before our Lord came into the world, they conquered Palestine and came in. They tolerated the Jews' religious stance, but they were a great military. The publicans collected public taxes, often guilty of extortion and despised by the Jews, because who were these publicans? You know who they were? They were Jews taking from the Jews. They were a lot of times were the Jews who were in that position to take taxes from the Jews. So I want you to see the climate here, what they were having to deal with this time, these people. And the Zealots were a political group. They, they definitely opposed any foreign power, of course. Now, culturally, the cultural situation here. The Greeks, their world empire was, was during this time period here, the, their Greek their culture influenced the world, and Koine Greek language common. So what's so significant about the Greek empire was their language. Now, we are Americans, and we have a tendency to go to any country and think what? That they should understand us. Don't we? We just think that. I mean, I, I hear, I've never been to all these other countries. I've been in Germany when I was a kid. But, but there's a concept that we think, well, you ought to understand what I'm saying. But I'm in there, but I'm in, say if I'm in, I don't know, France, I don't speak French, so, but I'm in their country. They're not supposed to, I cannot assume they're going to speak English just like I speak English. They may or may not, I don't know. But we have a tendency to think, and English is becoming more uh, globally accepted, I guess, in a way, being used. And those who have traveled have, have seen that, I guess. But back then, the Greek culture, the Greek language was, was throughout the land. And anywhere you travel, and Koine Greek, there's different kinds of Greek, but Koine Greek is the common person speaking, not the classical and the big long words and all that. So it gave them, at that time in the world, they, they were able to communicate no matter where you're going at. I want you to see here what's happening with this, this language here, because when Paul comes along and he goes to different areas, he goes to these different areas, he's able to speak into the language that they understand for them. The other is the Samaritans. Samaritans... They boasted that they were descendants from Jacob's, but they were a mixed race. They were mixed because the Assyrians, when the Assyrians conquered Israel at one time, they became interbred people, and they were a mixed race. And so they were what? If you saw, and we go into the life of Christ as we were to go into there, you would see that the woman at the well was what? A Samaritan woman. And the others, the other disciples did not think, whoa, this is strange. He's talking to a Samaritan, you know. They did not like talking to Samaritans. They liked being around Samaritans. Because they thought of them as a mixed breed of people. So that, that prejudice that they had among them. And of course the Jews themselves. They were looking for the Messiah. They were religiously monotheistic. In a world that was what? Polytheistic. And what does polytheistic mean? Many gods. The Romans, the Greeks, and all the countries they ever went to that around that area believed in many gods. We're almost getting to that point here and around us. People are starting to believe in all kinds of gods. You know? And the, but the Jews focused on one God. Is what they focused on. They were opposed by the Romans and the Hellenistic Jews were strongly influenced by the Greek culture. And of course the establishment of the, the synagogues. And the synagogues are important because they were what? What's so important about the synagogues for the Jews? even at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ when he came? I'm sorry? Well, it was for worship, not necessarily for sacrifice, but for worship. And that's, no matter where you were at in, in, a, in a town or if there was over 10 men, Jewish men, they could create a synagogue there or have a, a, a group of leaders there together. But they would have synagogues if they have it. But it, it gave what? It gave that sense of religious getting together as Jewish people. For them. This other thing is going to, a little lengthy here for you. <clears throat> this comes from a book, and I thought it was very important to see this about how 
The world was in a state of extraordinary moral degeneration. 2,000 lords in Rome had 1.3 million slaves, which were treated with great cruelty in the, in the empire. There were 6 million slaves. The rich lived in the utmost pro flagrancy. Chastity and marriage were the exception, while divorce and immorality were the rule. The priests preyed upon the masses of the ignorant. Many sed seductive cults exerted a, a degrading influence. The religion of the Romans, Romans had no power to cope with the degeneracy of the time. The philosophies of the Greeks failed. None of the philosophies could meet the deep moral needs of the time. Don't you think back then, their time, there was people like, where is, what is the meaning of life? You know, what am I doing here? And yet they were all into this world of sin, just, just kept on and on. There's another passage that goes with this. The emperors, I know it's very lengthy, but the emperors were monsters of crime. Thousands of lives were sacrificed in the arena to furnish entertainment for the emperor and a bloodthirsty population. Luxury was beyond description. Tacticus said that the spirit of the time was to corrupt and to be corrupted. Paul gives a picture of the Roman, in, in the Roman epistle of a people who had departed from, from the God revealed in nature and conscience to set up for themselves through vain independence, gods like unto creatures. From this idol worship they had gone on into more degeneracy and crime until they were lost in a world of darkness and destruction. This was the condition of the world morally when Jesus came, who was to overcome the world with his gospel. When the Lord came, the world was, was this bad. It was really bad shape. I mean, morally, a lot of ways it was just bad. But when the fullness of time was come, I think they'll, well, I'll show up here, get you all up here. There you are. Religiously, the Jews were awaiting the Messiah. That's what the Jews were doing. Culturally, common language for the known world was Greek. Geographically, the Roman road system throughout the empire. What's so significant about the, the, the road, road system for the Jews? For this time, for this time when the Lord came into the world at this time. This road system does what? Pardon? Gets you everywhere, just like the interstate, doesn't it? Gets you all over, the, all over the empire, and that's what was set up for it, so that Romans can move immediately across this empire, and how they can transmit information across the empire. So the Rome, but, but for, for the gospel's sake, when the gospel comes into place here, does what? It allows for the movement of the gospel across all the nations there, across the empire. Politically, there was Roman pox. Do you know what that is? I may not say the right word, say it the right way, but what is that? Come on now. You need a little music to think about this? What is that? Anybody? It's Roman peace. Because the Romans, the Romans were in charge militarily, but they also maintained the peace at that time among these countries. No matter who they ruled, they were dominating. And it was Roman peace is what that was called, considered there. And the last thing we just read was morally the extreme degeneracy. Just generous. Now, prophecies. Yep. Prophecies filled in, our, in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 14, verse 49, he said, I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Must be fulfilled. And he also, later on, when after the Lord Jesus Christ had was crucified, buried, and rose again, he was talking to those who were on the road to Damascus. He said, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures of the things concerning himself. Excuse me. The, thing, the, the expression, to be fulfilled, is stated in the gospel 30 times. Okay, that's 30 times. What if it was 29? I don't, but what I'm trying to get to is that it's stated in the scriptures here. This happened to be fulfilled. According to what the scripture said. It says it. This happened and this happened. If you ever read through, especially through, through Matthew here, and you see a lot of these in Matthew. It says this happened because to be fulfilled. Fulfilled. These things were to be fulfilled. Is there any, and I, I don't want to compare our Lord Jesus Christ to a religious leader, 
of other groups. But any of those others out there, is there anything about them, about prophecies, when they were to come into the world? I, don't, I never heard them say anything. I never heard any of them say that, be it whoever their leader is, uh, Buddha, whoever, was there, he was prophesied to be here and all these things about his life. I, don't, I, 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 I might be totally ignorant of that, but I've never heard anybody say anything about it. But we, as Christians, do say that Jesus Christ was prophesied to come into the world because the Scriptures say, the Scriptures, the, the, the Bible that we have says, this says he was going to come, these prophecies. So I'm going to show you an illustration about prophecies about the Lord here in a second. But it's very important to see this. We've got a couple of things about prophecies here. Here's some prophecies here. Can you see the table? You can see it pretty well, I guess. Uh, his pre-existence at his birth, before he came into the, and, and his birth, and his birth. Uh, one of those you're probably very familiar with is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which talks about his virgin birth. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. This prophecy was given hundreds and hundreds of years earlier by, by Isaiah. God allowed him to write it down, of course. About what? About the coming of the Messiah and that it was going to be Emmanuel. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord, by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted as God with us. Another reference here, and I use uh, Isaiah 53 and verse 3, where it says where he was rejected in his public ministry, where it says rejected by men. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, is acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces turned from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. In Mark chapter 3, verse 6, it says, And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. The prophecy was about how they were going to reject him. And then in Mark, you see where they were talking about they were actually going to do what they're going to have to do to reject him and try to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. Another one is, I got one last one here for you, <clears throat> about his death. In Psalm 22 and verse 18 about his garments. And Psalm 22 verse 18 says, And they, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now think about when that psalm was written hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. But here at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says in Matthew 27 verse 35, it says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vestures did they cast lots. Who else? Who else in history has had so much about prophecy about them to be fulfilled? Over 300 prophecies are stated directly in words relating to some aspect of Christ's person or work. 300. Now think about that. 300 prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you a number up here. <clears throat> if you can pronounce it, that's great. If you can figure it out. 300 prophecies. That's one with 90 zeros behind it. And that's not our budget. You know. That's not the stimulus package. I know you all were excited. But look at that number. Four. 300 prophecies to take place. It's one with all those big numbers behind it. Right there. Just for all three of the hundred of those. Do you know of anybody else? Anybody in the world who's ever had prophecies about them? 300 prophecies to 
occur for them? No. So let's just take it a little smaller here for you. So let's just take eight prophecies. Eight prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ. See that number there? That's one in 100 quadrillion. I could say that one. I know what the other, I think the other one has a name. <clears throat> so that's one with 17 zeros behind it. So still, what does that mean? To eight prophecies, just eight of those prophecies, and I show you that list there, and there's several there, but if eight of those prophecies were to take place for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's like, I'll illustrate this here for you in a minute. One in what? 100 quadrillion chances of happening? That's pretty, pretty high numbers, isn't it? So to illustrate this, I didn't come up with this illustration. <coughs> Here's the United States. You take Texas over here. Texas is about 773 miles one way, 801 miles the other way. Kind of gives you a rough idea. Texas is a pretty good sized place, isn't it? All right? I have one of these in my pocket here. I'll show it to you. This is a Morgan silver dollar. It's about this big right here. So if you took these Morgan silver dollars, and you see on there how thin they are. It's in a plastic case. So you took these silver dollars, and, and I marked one of these. Just put a little X on one, or somehow marked it with a piece of tape. And I laid it in Texas. But not just laying it in Texas. I'm covering the whole state of Texas with these things. To do that, I'm covering it with two feet deep of these things. Two feet deep. That's 254 coins stacked that way to make it two feet deep. Imagine that over the whole state of Texas. And then I have you go out there and you got one chance finding that one coin. How are you going to do that? Over the state of Texas. It seems impossible, doesn't it? That's what just 800, that's just with eight prophecies taking place for our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing, the prophecies about our Lord? That's what I'm trying to point out, how important it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. About all these prophecies about him, how he fulfilled these. Because who is he? Who is he? He's the Son of God. God in the flesh. So now getting into your lesson. That was the introduction. You thought, man, we'll never get to anything. This is the introduction. That was the introduction just to get you there. It's unexpected. His teaching was profound. His teaching was profound. Let me get my pages back. <coughs> In Mark chapter 1. Is that up there? Yeah, Mark. There it is. Got on my wrong slide here, but it's fine. He spoke of God as no... No man ever had. He drew tens of thousands of listeners out of cities and villages from all over the region to remote hillsides where his words held them captive for hours on end. <clears throat> this is what the author, and I'm, I'm quoting from the author from the book, and I think he has some good points about here, and that's what I'm quoting for you here. But to stop and think about that, and look at, let's look at Math, uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 22. I, don't have, I have it written here for myself, but if you want to turn there. Mark 1, 22, and it says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. When the Lord Jesus Christ was moving around and, and teaching and, and all that, and those, those people came from where? Came from the other villages, came out to hear him speak. All over, tens of thousands of people come out. You remember when he fed them on the hillside, when he fed them, the 5,000 you know, 5, men who sat down and besides those people, and all the fishes, and the, the, taking the fish and the loaves and splitting that up and feeding those people? Those thousands of people that followed him around because they never had heard anything from anyone like this, what he spoke of. His teaching impacted those people. Tens of thousands of people that heard him. They were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. And the scribes were who? Remember I told you earlier about the, the groups there? What were the scribes like? They were like the lawyers. They knew the details and all the, 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 and when we say lawyers, they knew the details of the word of God, and, but they did it to a point that it was legalistic for the people. But here the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching them and, bringing, and getting their attention there. His works were powerful. Did it move? Did it move? Okay, I thought it moved. 
He healed the lame, restored the sight to the blind. He cured the disease and even raised the dead. He performed countless miracles and word of him spread like wildfire. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 4, it says, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. I know we get so familiar and we hear these words, but you, can you imagine being there and hearing the Lord Jesus Christ preach and teach? And you got people that are sick with you, and he, he just heals them. People that your loved ones, right there. He's, he's healing these people. He healed their sick. Matthew 6, 33 says, And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities that outwent them, and, and, and came together unto him. Now turn there about Mark chapter 6. You, you're seeing that passage here, but you need to see it in context here. Mark chapter 6, if you want to see it there. Yeah, I know this is what the book had, but Mark chapter 6, in verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both that, that they had done and, and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart unto a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many among coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Can you imagine that? They got all these people coming and going, the disciples. It's just overwhelming. Wouldn't it be kind of great if we had that here at church? We had all those people coming and just become overwhelming that come to church with us to hear the gospel. And here... The Lord says, come you, yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. We like the part about resting, don't we? Yeah, man, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's do the resting part here. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. The disciples got into the ship, and they were kind of going away, trying to get somewhere to the desert. And it says, and the people saw them depart, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and out went them and came together unto, the, unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. I don't, I don't sing very well, but there's a song back in the 70s I knew. And I'm not going to try to sing it to you. But nobody wanted him. And nobody cared. They all forsook him. About the cross. Some of y'all probably know that song better than I do, but I just remember it came back to, when I saw this passage, this reminded me of that song back in the 70s I remembered. I am kind of old, you know, so I do remember those things. But, but nobody, you know, at this time they all wanted him. They wanted to be with him. They wanted to follow him wherever he went. You know, they were so enamored by what he was doing. And what was he doing? He was healing them. He was taking, he was, he was giving them teachings they'd never heard before, something that was different for them. But he was healing them. He was feeding them as well. And they came and flocked him. Of course, when Calvary comes, where are they at then? Nobody wanted him then. His love was incomparable. Is that sure? Yep. He loved the worst that humanity had to offer. The most sinful, the most broken, the most devastated. He accepted those whom society's elite disdained. He spent time with those the religious crowd rejected. He rejected, he reached out to the morally corrupt, the lowest of the low, file, low life and the poorest of the poor of Israel. How many of us say, ooh, I don't want to be around those people. I, <laughs> I don't want to be around them, man. That's, that's corruption there. I don't want to be around those people. And the Lord Jesus Christ did what? He reached out to all those people there. People that the religious leaders, the Pharisees did not want to be around. The Sadducees didn't want to be around these people. And look down upon them. Luke chapter 15 verses 1 and 2 says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And it's interesting it says the publicans and the sinners. They were obviously what? Like he says, like the author says, the, the people that would come with the low life, the people that, some of us, I don't be around those people. They're dirty, they're nasty, they talk bad, they they have bad habits, whatever. I just don't want to be around those people. But with it here, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Ooh, he eats with them too. What is wrong with this guy? That's why they were viewing, the Pharisees were viewing it differently. And Jesus was reaching out to help these people. 
John 13 verse 1 says, Now therefore the... And now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour is come, that he should depart out of the world into, un, unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. It's amazing how much our Lord loves loved people then. He loves people now. He's always loved people. And, always, and that's why he died for us, because he loved us so much. For God, you know, we know the passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we can say that right off our lips, right? But to stop and think how much God loves us, to allow his son to come into this world, to be treated like he was, and to die on the cross for us, because he loved us so very much. His claims were confrontational. Jesus defied the status quo with radical verbiage and behavior. He rebuked the religious leaders for their hypocrisy and legalism. Remember the Pharisees and all those religious people and the scribes? How they were always just against Jesus, always trying to find something against him. In Mark chapter 7, verse 7, he says, how, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We've said this before. What the, you get back to, and we talked about this last week a little bit, about real Christianity, about being a Christian. Are you a Christian? What do you got your trust in? Are you got your trust in, well, I'm carrying a Bible around, or I do these certain things, I do these certain actions, and that, are we doing things, works, to think that's making us a Christian? That's not right. And people teach that, don't they? People teach that, well, you got to do this, and you got to do that, and you got to do these kind of things. But go back to what does the Bible say? And Jesus addresses, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, Men, people just like us, telling us how to be religious. Luke chapter 11, verse 45, verse 46. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying thou reproachest us also? And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. These guys, these lawyers, these scribes, laid out these rules for people and didn't so much as do anything themselves. He said things that angered and mortified those who claimed to love and serve God. He claimed to be God often. He claimed to, to forgive sins freely and with the total disregard to religious laws and procedures. And I know that sounded kind of a little strange, but the Lord was not being dictated by the world and how they did and what they were living as far as, you know, here's this, the Pharisee said, oh, you got to do it this way, and the Sadducees got to do it this way. No, 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 no. The Lord Jesus Christ laid out, this is the way it is. He gave them the truth just like it was, and they didn't like it. It offended them. Mark chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why do this man thus speak blasphemy? Can who can forgive sins but God only? To always, always challenge the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what he was doing. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming to the Father but by me. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? That's a very bold statement, which is a correct statement, we know. That there's no way to get to heaven but through the Lord Jesus Christ. He claimed to be the door to salvation, the bread of eternal life. John chapter 10, verse 9 says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. John 6, 35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. When he said these things, do you think the Pharisees were all excited? Boy, that sounds great. Now we know the answer. Now we know how we can get to heaven. No, those religious leaders were like, there's something wrong here. It's going against everything we were teaching and what we have been trained and what we've been doing all of our lives. But the Lord Jesus Christ said that he, what he said, I am the door. By me, if any man are in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. In John 6, 35, and Jesus said, I am the bread of life. 
When he said these things to reach those people, to reach those souls, to help them, wasn't there one of those Pharisees in John chapter 3 that listened? Who was that Pharisee? Nicodemus. Yeah, he'd been raised in a religious world and religiously taught, and he was a Pharisee as well. But he was one of the few that we know of that ever accepted Christ as his Savior and accepted him, what he said. In that world that the Lord Jesus Christ came in, can you imagine those people? How, and we, I guess because we are so far removed from that and we know so much now and we have a Bible in our hand. But you think about back then. They didn't have a Bible in their hand. They didn't have easy access to the Internet and that kind of stuff that we're so used to. Well, let's go look it up, you know. We do that on the Internet. We have so much information running around us all the time. But think about back then, those poor people there, and didn't even know no more than what these religious guys who were dressed up to the hilt and what they walked around and said, you know, hey, I'm the Pharisee, I'm the greatest one around here, and, and the Sanhedrins and the Sadducees and all these religious leaders they had who were teaching them wrong things. But here you got the Lord Jesus Christ who comes and teaches them that he is the way. When he, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's something they had never heard before from these religious guys. They were never pointed out from these religious guys that there's a way to God is differently than what you're trying to teach us. Because he said to the scribes, what did he say about those scribes? You got people by commandments. You're giving man's commandments to teach them, yet you don't do anything yourself. This is the world that those people lived in when the Lord Jesus Christ came. And the rampant moral decay that was going on among those people as well. This is where I'm going to stop at for this part of the lesson here. <clears throat> Does anybody have any comments, any questions? Silence, silence, silence. Oh, Brother Doug. Does anyone know any prophecies of I don't know of any. That's why I never heard anybody say. Yeah. Nope. And that's what I'm saying. There's, look at any, you hate to compare Lord Jesus Christ to these religious people. You know what I mean? It's, we're talking about the Son of God compared to somebody else. But, but all these people who stood up and thought they were great, where are they at now? And how do they, their religious life that they were? It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. About Him. And if you don't have Him as your Lord and Savior, Sad situation for you. Anybody have any comments? Any other questions? All right, Lord willing, we'll do part B of this, and hopefully I can get through part B next week, because I gave you a lot of introduction. I understand that this morning, but hopefully we'll get through the rest of this next week. All right, we'll have nothing else. We'll go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we thank you for taking care of us. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, uh, your kindness. We thank you for your words. We thank you, Lord, that you that we have the ability and have in our hands to be able to read your scriptures that you allow us to have, your word. And we just thank you so much for that. I know it's your words that are more important than my words or any of the author of this study or anybody else, but, but help us, Lord, to, to, to worship you and honor you. And, and just thank you for your words and what you give us. Help our families take care of them, uh, each one, and whatever each family is dealing with right now. You know all the families and what's going on. Those families are important. And dear Father, we ask you to take care of those who might be traveling and, and, uh, and those who are, are recuperating for surgeries and those who are, are homebound and not able to get out. Uh, just, Lord, just take care of them. Help us through all of this, uh, what we're going through, and help with the upcoming election as well. Dear Father, we ask you to help pastor the strength and the grace and the wisdom he needs this morning. Just hug him up beside you, Lord, and help him to know what to say and to do and Help us, Lord, to put away our petty things in our own hearts and lives to be vessels meant for your use. In Jesus' very precious name we ask and thank you, Lord. Amen.